Before I dive into the pyramids video, I do just wanna say I have not done this in over a year, so I hope it is at least as good as it was before, if not better, but time will tell. Uh, future me editing this will will be able to tell. Mainly I'm just saying that because I am sorry if I look at my notes while I am going through this because historically I've tried not to do that or at least not do it on camera, but for this I am definitely gonna have to be going through my notes, so sorry about that. I have read Pyramids by Terry Pratchett several times throughout my life. Historically it has been one of my favorite novels, but when I re- Yes, dog? Historically, it has been one of my favorite of the Discworld novels, but when I reread it for this read-along, I wondered why I had loved it so much. The first time I reread it, I finished the book and thought, I kind of see why people were surprised when I told them that Pyramids was one of my favorites. It doesn't hold up as well as I thought that it did. But something interesting happened when I read it again after a year away. I found myself enjoying it a lot more and I remembered some of the reasons why I loved it so much earlier in my life. And we're gonna dive into some of those reasons a little bit later on in this video. We're gonna start things off though by talking about the way that Pyramids is formatted and then I'm going to summarize the book as a whole. This isn't a very solid show. Pyramids features a very unique structure to Discworld, especially compared to some of the previous books that we've read. It's a lot more like Color of Magic than it is like the other books. Color of Magic, if you'll remember, was a series of novellas that were combined into one longer novel, and it really felt that way. The novels were pretty disconnected from one another, even if they were technically telling the journey of these characters of Rince, Wind, and Two Flower over the course of these several books. They felt like different books between each of them. Um, for this one, it's kind of similar in that it's broken up into books, but it was all written to be a cohesive whole as opposed to being several different chunks that were then later combined into one full story. Instead of being broken into chapters, it is just broken up into these four books. And those books are the Book of Going Forth, the Book of the Dead, the Book of the New Sun, and the Book of 101 Things a Boy Can Do. Did I get that right? Yes, I did get that right, and I got it in the correct order, so go me. Now, obviously, as you would probably expect, each of these names means something. I think the Book of the Dead is a pretty obvious one, but the other ones are kind of interesting. The Book of the New Sun is a reference to an actual book called the Book of the New Sun, S-U-N. It is also just self-referential for the events that happen in Pyramids, so that one's pretty obvious. Uh, the Book of 101 Things a Boy Can Do is also obvious, at least to anybody who has ever visited their local library as a child. There was a series of books called the Book of 101X, there were a lot of them. But the one that I find to be the most interesting is actually the book of Going Forth because it is both self-referential and externally referential. In The Light Fantastic, I believe, it might be The Color of Magic, but I'm pretty sure in The Light Fantastic, there is a book called uh, that is referenced in Discworld called The Book of Going Forth Around 11-ish. And that in itself was already a reference to the Book of Going Forth. The Book of the Dead was actually originally called, or an alternate title for the Book of the Dead, is the Book of Going Forth by Day. And then in The Light Fantastic, we have the Book of Going Forth Around 11-ish referenced. So there is both the Book of Going Forth by Day in the real world and the Book of Going Forth Around 11-ish in the disc world. And now we have the Book of Going Forth, which is a reference essentially to both of those things. I am not the first person to have noticed this. This is actually my first time noticing noticing it myself because this is my first chronological read through of Discworld. And so having read The Light Fantastic, I picked up on the fact that, hey, I think the book of going forth was referenced earlier on in the series and sure enough it was. Um, but apparently everybody in the Discworld fandom already knew that. So it's not like I made some sort of cool discovery, um, but it was a new discovery for me. And maybe this is the first time you're hearing that too. Anyway, that is the structure of Pyramids. Now let's go ahead and dive into the summary. This is where I'm going to be getting into spoilers. So if you don't want any spoilers for Pyramids, thank you for watching the introduction for some reason, but you can go ahead and go read Pyramids and then come back to this when you are finished. There's really not an excuse at this point for you to have not been finished reading Pyramids. I did initially tell you I gave you a month and then I gave you a year. So you should have been finished reading it by now. I'm going to be taking advantage of the actual structure of Pyramids that I have already discussed here when I go through this. So instead of just giving you a summary of the entire book, I'm going to give you a summary of each of the books within Pyramids. So we're gonna start with book one and we'll work our way through summarizing book four. So this is gonna be a little bit longer than my previous summaries have been. Book one, 
the book of Going Forth. This is actually where we kick things off in a pretty exciting way, but also a confusing one. When we first meet our protagonist, Tepic, he is effectively the prince of Egypt, uh, or in this world's case, he is the prince of Jelly Baby, the son of Tekimon, um, or Tepekimon. I am going to mispronounce just about everything in this book, just so you know, but I'm pretty sure it's Patekimon. Um, but he is the son of Patekimon. He is currently taking his assassin's exam, and he is uh, also experiencing flashbacks that in my mind were really confusing, especially at the start of a book, because you really don't know what's going on. And he's also flashing between two previous time periods in his life. So we're flashing between while he was actually studying to be an assassin, and we are flashing back to his time in Jelly Baby as well, like the time that he left and the time that he spent there. And then we're also flashing back to the present which is when he's actually taking the exam. This chapter is really confusing, especially when I hadn't read the book in a long time and I was picking it back up. When I picked it back up again to reread it before filming this video after a year, I already knew what this chapter was about and so I was totally clear on it and it didn't confuse me as much. But when I picked it up after several years of having not read it, this chapter kind of threw me for a loop and I was a bit confused on what exactly was going on. I will note, I didn't really like the way this book opened because it was so confusing jumping between these three different time periods without any real clarity on what was happening. At the end of the exam, Tepic is of course given the final task of killing somebody, as you'd expect for an assassin's exam. But he doesn't want to do this and he attempts to deliberately fail the exam by firing his crossbow in a wayward and haphazard fashion. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, the crossbow bolt uh, ricochets, hits the target instead, and he basically um, aces the exam with style as opposed to failing it like he had wanted to. Um, and now Tepic is a certified assassin. In the meantime, back in Jelly Baby, King Patekimon um, dies. He passes away and death comes. We get a brief scene with death. Of course, mine and almost everyone else's favorite character in Discworld. Uh, we get a brief scene with him and death doesn't actually do what he normally does. He doesn't collect the king's soul. Instead, he leaves him to be a ghost. This is because of the king's religious beliefs and the religious beliefs of everybody in Jelly Baby. Um, which is in, you know, a pantheon of bestial gods. And now the king is essentially damned to his pyramid for all of existence. He becomes a ghost and he very quickly realizes that everything he has believed in his entire life is totally ridiculous. And he really wants out. He does not want to be cursed to this ghostly existence. Now, Tepic, having just passed his exam and being quite far from home, suddenly realizes that he needs to go home uh, and assume his duties. So he returns to Jelly Baby. With Tepic returning to Jelly Baby, we are going to move on to book two, the book of the dead. Oop. Tepic returns home for the first time in a while, and he is immediately uh, put in charge, essentially, of funeral arrangements. But I say put in charge, he kind of just goes along with what he is told by our uh, pseudo villain Dios. I'm not totally certain I would classify Dios as a villain. He's more just a very confused and obnoxious person, but we'll get more into that in a little bit. But Dios is essentially conveying what Tepic's father is telling Dios. Um, but Tepic's father is trying to tell Dios, hey, I want a burial at sea. I don't want a pyramid. I don't want any of this. But Dios is telling Tepic that his father wants the biggest and the grandest of pyramids. He wants something incredibly extravagant. He wants it to tower over all of the others. And so Tepic agrees to give his father a fantastic and magnificent pyramid that has all of the Sims mods installed. They are going to enter the cheat code that gives you unlimited money and they are going to build the best dang thing that Jelly Baby has ever seen. After this, Tepic takes on the usual regal duties and uh, begins to enact laws and rulings and things of that nature, except he learns very quickly that he doesn't actually have any authority because every single thing that he says, every ruling he gives, anything that he thinks is fair, Dios just interprets, much like he interpreted Tepic's father's uh, ghostly desires, and Dios basically has whatever it is that he wants or that he thinks should happen occur. He overrides whatever Tepic wants to do, any changes he wants to make with essentially upholding the tradition that have always been part of Jelly Baby. The final ruling that Tepic is supposed to give that night is for Tracy, who is one of Tepic's father's handmaidens. She has refused to perform the ceremonial poisoning that would render her uh, dead so that she can spend all of eternity continuing to serve Tekimon uh, 
and that's not what she wants. She refuses that. And so while uh, Tepic doesn't really think that's a big deal and doesn't want to sentence her, Dio says that Tepic's real sentencing is that she's going to be sentenced to death. I believe by being eaten alive by crocodiles or maybe alligators, one of those, um, but being eaten alive. She's being sentenced to death against Tepic's wishes. Now this Tepic does take into his own hands because he puts on a disguise and puts his assassin's uh, training to good use. Tepic sneaks into the prison, he sets her free, and he escorts her to an embalming room where he stores her for safekeeping until he is able to get her fully out of Jelly Baby and help her out. Dios is, of course, incredibly perturbed to find that Tracy has escaped. Later on, Tepic goes back to find her in the embalming room and set her free, but Dios does manage to catch up to them. Now, Dios also seemingly becomes convinced that Tepic is not actually the king, but is in fact an assassin who was sent to kill the king. I am not 100% clear on whether or not Dios really believes this, but it does seem like he genuinely believes that Tepic is an assassin. This is kind of one of the more confusing bits in the story for me. I'm not certain at this point what Dios' real nature and wants are. I personally think that Dios is just so much of a traditionalist moron that he doesn't realize Tepic really is Tepic, and he is absolutely convinced that Tepic is an assassin. So Tepic and Tracy are going to be caught and escorted back to the city, probably to both be executed, when a massive cataclysmic event erupts forth from the pyramid and gives them the time and uh, opportunity that they need to escape. And while this big, uh, strange event is occurring that distorts time space and reality itself in Jelly Baby, they take off on a camel named You Bastard. You're gonna get more of You Bastard, the greatest mathematician the disc has ever known, in book three. The book of the new sun kicks off um, with Tracy and Tepic uh, looking around and realizing that Jelly Baby is just gone. Uh, Tracy does notice that you can actually see Jelly Baby if you look in the right spot. To me, that is kind of like the, I think it's called a stereograph. Um, one of those images where you have to look at it in a certain way and it's kind of challenging to do, but you can eventually see um, like a special picture in there. They're not really sure how to tackle this. So Tepic decides that they should just go to the city of Ephibi to seek out some guidance from the philosophers there. Uh, which is going to be a pretty fun bit that we will get to here shortly. However, back in Jelly Baby, everyone is witnessing this massive cataclysmic event and the, uh, I think, is it called a carpenter? It wouldn't be carpenter, that's wood. Pyramids are made of wood. Uh, the architect of the pyramids, Teclusp, is, uh, makes a discovery that they have essentially been put into an alternate dimension. And in this alternate dimension that uh, Jelly Baby is now in, the gods are real. Their gods, the big bestial monstrous gods that they have worshipped all their life. And it's a pretty interesting contrast uh, to what it was beforehand where everybody just worshipped the gods, but you're not sure if everyone believed in them. They were just a thing that was always there and you were supposed to worship them. But now they're kind of faced with the fact that, oh, the gods are real and they're all here and they are causing absolute havoc and mayhem. They're fighting each other. They are essentially uh, kind of a big titanic backdrop to all of the events that are gonna happen in Jelly Baby from here on. They don't really interact with the world all that much. Dios actually attempts to say that he is now in charge not just of the people, but of the gods, except they don't listen to him. Dios is not in charge of anything, uh, especially not the gods. Yeah, the gods just really kind of ignore Dios, which good. Dios kind of had a history of ignoring Tepic and everybody else around him and uh, insisting on tradition over change. And now the gods are completely ignoring him and do not care about his existence. Uh, they are basically just fighting. We'll talk a little bit more about my thoughts on this part later on, but the gods are, you can just kind of picture like whatever you're doing, just off in the distance, you just see Godzilla and King Kong duking it out next to some skyscrapers while you're gardening or whatever. They're just kind of there in the background uh, for every scene in Jelly Baby from here on. Now, to cause further problems for Dios and Jelly Baby, uh, Tekimon, Tepic's father, suddenly wakes up and he stuffs all of his organs back into his body and he takes his mummified corpse and goes to check out what in the world all the racket outside is about. A bit like when my neighbors uh, fire off their guns into the air whenever the Chiefs score a touchdown home run thing. Um, yeah, it's a lot like that. Uh, I just kind of stuff my organs back into myself and go outside to figure out what in the world is so important that they're firing off guns for. Once Tepic is up and about, he realizes that if he's up, so must all of his ancestors be. And so he has uh, the embalmer who is with him and the embalmer's apprentice help him break out uh, all of his ancestors who are all ghosts and who all, much like Tekimon, 
really are starting to think that building pyramids and being sealed inside them for eternity wasn't such a great idea. Tepic and Tracy, meanwhile, make it to Ephibi and they meet with the philosophers and Tepic is actually invited to a summit that they have. Tracy is not invited, but don't worry, it's not because they're sexist, it's just because as a woman, if she heard all of their philosophical ramblings, her brain would explode because she wouldn't be able to handle all of that. So they're not sexist, they're just kind of looking out for her well-being. So Tepic goes to the summit. Uh, he goes there and he hears all these people basically rambling and yammering. No one is actually listening. They are all just straight up talking, except for one person who is Endos the Listener. Endos? I think it's Endos. Endos the Listener. Um, and he is actually only listening because he is paid to be there and listen to them yammer. But eventually Tepic is able to break through all of this and get answers to what he wants uh, from Pythagolon? Path Pythagonal. Patho pa Pythag He's able to get answers from a uh, philosopher there named Pythagonal who tells him that it is actually the shape of the pyramid that is causing time and space to distort around Jelly Baby and is actually causing Jelly Baby to be stuck in a time period that has already passed. A little on the nose, but we're going to talk more about this a little bit later, and it is part of why I love this book as much as I do, especially rereading it here pretty recently. Tepic is reunited with Tracy. He tells her everything, and she actually suggests that they just kind of leave Jelly Baby behind. Let it be distorted in this time period, and let it stay in this alternate dimension, and let them just go on and live uh, lives outside of it. I mean, what's back there for them anyway? He was barely a king. Dios wants them dead. What's the point? While they are discussing this, Tepic hears a familiar voice from his time at the Assassin's Guild. It is the voice of his old friend Chitter, who invites them to have dinner with him, and he uh, proposes that the kingdom of Jelly Baby be uh, sort of allied with his group of people who are definitely not pirates. While Tepic is thinking about this, he has a dream that night that is basically ripped straight out of the Bible, and it is absolutely hilarious. It is essentially Joseph's dream from, I think, Genesis or Exodus, one of those two books. Um, that talks about the seven fat cows and the seven skinny cows. I think the only real difference there is just that there wasn't a trombone in the Bible and there's a trombone in, uh, in Tepic's dream. Once Tepic's dream has ended and he is spurred into action, he takes the camel, you bastard, and goes all the way back to Jelly Baby, or at least he starts his journey back there, but he is fraught with uh, some dangers along the way. The first of these dangers is actually him uh, reaching into a different dimension, but it is not the dimension that he wanted to go to. So Tepic and you bastard enter a pocket dimension with a sphinx who tells him the riddle that is very common and very annoying about the uh, the creature that walks on, I think, four legs during the day and two legs at noon and three legs at night or something like that, something along those lines. It's a really dumb one. It's never made any sense. And Terry Pratchett actually calls out how little sense the riddle makes. And there is a really long and honestly, one of my favorite sequences probably that I have read at least thus far in Discworld chronologically that uh, goes into just dismantling this terrible riddle until the Sphinx finally gives him a version of the riddle that makes sense, but it's completely ridiculous and long and gives you the answer from the very start. It was really good. I really enjoyed that sequence. It went on for longer than I remembered it going on for, but I think that that is to its betterment. It's one of those jokes that just keeps going, but it doesn't stop being funny, at least to me. Tepic does make it out of the Sphinx's pocket dimension and he makes it to Jelly Baby. Now the scene in Jelly Baby, like I said, is Godzilla and King Kong are duking it out in the city, but they're not really acknowledging that anybody or anything else exists. And the priests are trying desperately to get the gods to listen to them and are very confused as to why the gods are not listening to them when they have worshipped these gods for such an incredibly long time. Dios himself, who is proposed to be basically the new ruler of Jelly Baby at this point, he's in charge of everything and everyone. The gods are here. He should be in charge of them. He also is continuing to have absolutely no effect whatsoever on the gods. They just do not care. And it is at this point that Dios recalls that a long time ago, kings were actually sacrificed to gods to get them to listen to them and uh, heed their prayers and heed their calls. And so he gets the idea of why don't I just sacrifice a king to the gods and move on with this. As Dios and the priests are deliberating over how to go about sacrificing a king to the gods, uh, all of the mummies, all of Tepic's relatives uh, who were mummified and entombed, burst into the pyramid of King Cuffed and discover some bizarre writing on the wall. And that results in a pretty hilarious uh, translation chain 
if I remember correctly, and this isn't in my notes, but if I recall, um, basically what has to happen is one person can translate it into one language and then another person can translate from that language into another and it creates this chain of people trying to translate the writing. All right, so Tepic, finally back in the kingdom of Jelly Baby, heads to the palace to find that there is nobody there. And so confused, he kind of wanders around trying to find people until he finds them all down by the riverbank. And this is where he learns that the priests have started to try to find a way to speak with the dead so that they can figure out uh, how to get control of the gods and all of that. And as a result, the priests have taken in all of the boats, preventing Tepic from crossing the river. As Tepic is trying to figure out how to cross the river, he feels this sort of godlike power begin to channel through him, and he uses that power to split the river uh, into two and walk on dry land, another biblical nod. And he navigates the City of the Dead in this acrobatic fashion as he makes his way toward the Grand Pyramid that is kind of the source of all of this horror that is happening to the City of Jelly Baby. Once he is at the pyramid, he seeks out the architect uh, Teclusp and talks to him about what is going on and explains that the phenomenon is actually caused by the pyramid itself and its shape. This is where any subtlety of the story really starts to fall apart and be, just becomes a, a lot more clear and direct exactly what this is about and what Terry Pratchett is trying to convey here. The ancestors, all these mummified people, are confronted by or confront the priests that are led by Dios. Um, and in this confrontation is revealed that Dios has actually lived for thousands of years and is actively trying to fight change. He is trying to do everything he can to prevent Jelly Baby from being changed and prevent traditions from being altered because that will mean that Jelly Baby is a place that can change. As this confrontation is occurring, that is when everyone realizes that Tepic is uh, moving to destroy the pyramid. He is currently marching toward it or flipping toward it. I'm pretty sure he's like doing cool flips and parkour moves as an assassin, like that assassin stuff is coming back into play here. Um, and he is making his way up to the pyramid to destroy it. Dios is pretty content to allow the gods themselves to stop Tepic, which is what the gods would want to do because destroying the pyramids uh, is going to destroy them. But the ancestors actually come to Tepic's defense and allow Tepic to finally destroy the pyramid once and for all. Destroying the pyramid sends everyone and everything back to the way that it is supposed to be. It removes uh, Jelly Baby from this alternate dimension. Uh, um, I think Dios, this, this also was not in my notes, which is weird. It should be in my notes. I'm pretty sure Dios is also destroyed as part of that, as a representation of these old traditions and such dying away and uh, moving on to something new, right? Letting go of these old things that they have held on to for many, many years. I'm pretty sure that's what happens. I think he dies like in a manner uh, akin to, you know, looking at the Ark of the Covenant or something where right? he just turns, he just rapidly ages and withers away into nothing. All of those years that he has lived finally catch up to him. Jelly Baby not only is restored to what it was before, but now it can actually progress and let go of those old traditions that it has held on to for so very long. It means that Tepic is now able to be in charge without Dios's intervention. He can just straight up do what he wants and needs to do and do what he sees as right and actually make the changes that need to be made. Chitter actually eventually reaches uh, Jelly Baby with Tracy in tow, and Tracy suggests that uh, she and Tepic run along and just leave the kingdom together and abandon it. That's when they realize that they're siblings. Tracy, I recall, didn't really seem to care all that much about them being siblings and was totally down to clown regardless, but Tepic was pretty phased by it and did not want to clown around with his own sister. Uh, Tepic actually gives the kingdom over to Tracy and tells her that she should rule it, which is just another, you know, positive slap in the face to the classic traditions of the kingdom of Jelly Baby. And then Tepic goes on his own journey. He assumes his own path and leaves uh, the kingdom behind on his own. Tracy, now as the queen of Jelly Baby, enacts new traditions, gets rid of the old ones, and changes the kingdom uh, in, in new ways. Actually brings change to it, uh, which was rejected for thousands of years because of Dios's uh, continued grasp on the way things had always been. That's kind of where we leave it. Oh, and death comes back to finally claim the souls of all of those ancestors, so they do actually get a happy ending. Whew. Okay. That was a lot, so I need a fresh drink, um, and then we're gonna go ahead and get into talking about what I think of pyramids. I think I need a change of scenery before we uh, before we get into the next part, so give me a minute here. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to be dividing my thoughts into two sections. My initial thoughts about pyramids and then my realizations about it that occurred when I reread it in order to prepare for finally filming 
this video essay because my thoughts when I first wrote this essay were vastly different from how I felt after I reread the novel and had a fresh set of eyes and new thoughts on it. On a surface level, and when I first wrote this essay, Pyramids just kind of seemed like another novel that was simply dogging on religion like so many others. And we know how Terry Pratchett felt about religion, and that is clear in several of his books. This one, I think, especially because there's not a lot of subtlety to his views on traditionalism and religion in this novel. So at first, I thought it was just a very simple novel that was just saying, hey, religion sucks and tradition is stupid. Um, that was my thought when I first wrote my initial video essay, which was a lot more negative um, than what this one is going to end up being. I think that um, my, my notes initially had it at roughly a three or three and a half star novel, which I believe is on par with being just a little better than Color of Magic, which is the one that I have liked the least out of Discworld um, so far in this chronological read through. Um, and so that kind of surprised me after rereading it again and going back to my notes from my first reread uh, last year because I felt very differently when I finished it this most recent time. I knew though when I started drafting the post that it was going to be a long one because there was going to be a lot to talk about. This turned out to be a surprisingly divisive novel even before I had announced the read through. Some people had said that they weren't really looking forward to Pyramids or that they didn't like it and were surprised to hear that I liked it and then when I actually posted the discussion post again a year ago, sorry. Um, when I posted that discussion post a year ago, a lot of folks were saying that they um, just didn't really enjoy it all that much and felt like it was very ham-fisted. And I knew that I was just gonna have a lot to talk about and this was gonna be a kind of negative one, which is something I wasn't super stoked about. I don't like being negative on my favorite author or on my favorite series, but I am as honest as I possibly can be. And so here I am being honest again and saying that I was wrong with my initial thoughts when I did my first reread last year. This most recent reread told me this book has a lot more to it than just the in your face traditional dogging and in your face religion hating. There's a lot more to it than that and I'm really excited to get into it. In the gap between my reading of Pyramids and my reread of Pyramids, a lot happened to me that I think affected that reread in ways I didn't anticipate and that kind of gave me a perspective that I wasn't expecting to have when I went back to reread it. Pyramids is not just a book about challenging and hating religion and dogging on it and all of that and saying religion is bad. Pyramids is a book about challenging all of our traditions, all our habits and all our beliefs and asking us to take another look at them and ask if they're ridiculous. Are we just doing this thing because we have always done it? Are we just thinking this thing? Are we just adhering to this thing because that's the way that it has always been? Or is there not a better way to do what we are doing uh, in regards to this? And I don't think that just applies to religion. It applies to everything. And I think that just about anything can be a tradition. However, even if we do limit it to just being about religion, even if we say, yeah, Pyramids is explicitly a book about how bad religion is, I think you can still draw an important message from that, which is that you should also look at your religious beliefs and the things that you think there and ask yourself, is what I believe right and good and is it making the world a better place for me to do so? Or would changing what I believe and reflecting on what I think improve my life and the lives of those around me? Would it make my kingdom better if I stopped believing that everybody should have pyramids built over them and they should be entombed there for all eternity? And it's actually that religious note of it that I think is why I remember loving pyramids so much when I read it previously. When I first read Pyramids, at least the time that I remember reading it and it having an impact on me, um, I was at a pretty significant turning point in my life, especially in regards to religion and religious beliefs. Part of that turning point involved letting go of several of those beliefs and adopting new ones in order to advance myself and make myself better and honestly just make the world around me a better place and make myself a lot less uh, insufferable. I would compare Pyramids to pretty much just any deconstruction book. It's just fictionalized. It is about deconstructing where you're at and taking a look at everything and looking at the granular pieces that make up all of your beliefs and all your traditions and dismantling those things. Yes, it does hit the nail on the head really aggressively and without a lot of subtlety for pretty much the entirety of the novel. It is extremely in your face about it, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I do prefer when Terry Pratchett is more subtle with the messaging that he has, but I don't think it's necessarily terrible to not be subtle in some instances. And for something like this, 
maybe subtlety wasn't going to be the best move anyway. I mean, look at the boys. People watch the boys and root for the bad guys, even though they're very clearly the bad guys, because, I don't know, media literacy has gone down the toilet and maybe subtlety is not the best option. I'll also say the boys is not very subtle as of like season two and three. Uh, it really stopped being subtle and people still don't get the message. So I don't know. Uh, maybe Terry Pratchett just thought, I really want to make sure people understand what I'm saying, so I can't risk them misinterpreting anything in this book, and he just hammered it all out there and laid it bare. Essentially, Pyramids is less religion is bad, and more it's good to grow, and it's not good to stagnate and just always do the same thing just because it's the thing that you've always done. Now, I will say, sometimes the tradition you have or the habit you formed or whatever your beliefs are might be a good thing. And maybe you are better for them and maybe there isn't a change that's necessary. But being willing to take a look at yourself and your beliefs and change if it's needed, that is what I think Pyramids is really about. It's about accepting that change is a good thing and that sometimes change is needed and you shouldn't resist it just because things might be different as a result. So in my opinion, while the writing and the story don't really have a whole lot of regard for me, the message of it and the intent behind Pyramids do have a high regard for me. And so I think I will give this one four stars personally. The story and writing itself, like three stars, but the message and the intent behind it, I would honestly give five stars just because it has so much meaning for me especially. So I think landing on four stars for Pyramids makes sense for me. So it's a little higher of a rating than I would have given it last year. Now, if it weren't for this next section, I would not have come back to do the Pyramids video. And this next section is what you thought about Pyramids, what people who are participating in the read-along really thought about it. And I'm sorry it has taken me a year to talk about what you thought of this book. Thank you for taking the time to comment on the discussion post. Thank you for taking the time to message me to find out if I was all right and when I was coming back. I appreciate all of that. It means a lot. And I came back because I wanted to do this next section of the essay. And that is talk about what you thought of this novel. So let's go ahead and get into that. So if you don't know, my YouTube community page has a poll after each of these read-alongs. And when I do the guards guards one, I will put up a poll for that. I am not giving this up and we'll talk more about that later. But if you want to check out when those discussion posts go up, I suggest being subscribed so you see them show up in your feed. Like, comment, subscribe, all that random YouTube stuff. First of all, the average star rating between your rating and mine wound up being about four stars, which is pretty good. Um, I expect it to be closer to like two or three stars initially, um, especially after my first reading, but we wound up at about four stars, which is pretty great. Essentially what this really means to me is that more people than initially thought they would enjoy the book enjoyed Pyramids, especially on a reread. Lots of people had told me that they remember not liking Pyramids at all and that they weren't looking forward to it and they didn't like it and were surprised that Pyramids was one of my favorites. I wouldn't say Pyramids is one of my favorites anymore after having reread it twice, but it does mean a lot to me and I'm glad to see that other people appear to have taken some enjoyment or message away from it enough that they would give it a higher star rating. That's the star rating. Star ratings are fun, but the real nuance of this discussion and the whole point of these video essays is to get into the comments and talk about what you think about pyramids and what your thoughts were, what you told me, blah, 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 yada, yada. I just wanna get into it. So we're gonna go ahead and kick things off with Wolverine's comment. Wolverine said, it's hard to say as I love every Discworld book in the moment. It definitely seems one of the least essential, but prepares for assassin background, expansion on the role of gods, and is fun with all the maths, cloning shenanigans, and labor challenges of the Teclusp family. Teclusp, I cannot talk. These words are screwing me up. What a video to come back to is the one that has all the things I can't pronounce. And labor challenges of the Teclusp family. And you bastard. Uh, again, you bastard, a fan favorite, fantastic. Not quite as good as death, but he is high up there. And thinking about what's coming up with the next few novels with Guards Guards being the next one, and I'm really pumped for that. That is another one that not only do I really remember loving, but that everyone seems to remember loving. So I'm pretty confident I can say Guards Guards is gonna be the best one that we have read so far in the chronological read through. Um, but I can definitely see how reading Pyramids right now, knowing Guards Guards is next, feels kind of non-essential and you're just excited to get to the next thing and Pyramids is more of a 
bump in the road as opposed to something that is putting your foot on the accelerator to get to the real weeds of disc world. However, I will say that the world building is really important in pyramids um, and really set you up for a lot of success. That's mentioned in your comment. Uh, you talk about the assassin background and the expansion of the role of the gods. You do a lot more traveling in this one to places of significance than you do in the previous disc world novels. I mean, we start off in Ankh Morpork with uh, the Assassin's Guild, like there's a lot more places of real relevance, kind of like in, uh, I think it's e is it Equal Rights, where you travel a lot with, uh, with the girl. I think I'm rambling and don't make any sense. I'm gonna cut this part out. Yes, it, it is more of a bump in the road as opposed to something that is putting your foot on the gas to spur you into the real weeds of Discworld. Not that when you're driving, you wanna go through the weeds. I guess if you're off-roading. It's not a bad thing that this is a world building book, but reading through chronologically, it does feel kind of bad to have pyramids very abruptly after a couple of really solid um, story-based books. But again, I feel like pyramids is a lot more about the message that it's conveying than about being a fantastic story. This next one is a little bit long, which I do appreciate, I'm not complaining, but bear with me as I read through this. Amy Myers says, Hello, it's taken some time to organize my thoughts about pyramids. Yeah, it took me a year, so you're okay. This is my first time reading it. I also consulted the annotated Pratchett File website for help with obscure references. I rated pyramids two stars. Out of the entirety of Discworld books, this one was lackluster. Pratchett included a lot of clever things, how the pyramids were built, the pyramids' effects on time, pocket slash parallel worlds, the priest cast, and immortality. My major criticisms, without getting into too many spoilers, are of the lack of character development, especially Tracy, and cut and paste tropes from mythology and history. I wanted more direct action in the plot by the gods of Jelly Baby, rather than references to them being parts of the scenery and causing destruction. I've studied archetypal myth criticism, and I have a little bit more knowledge of myths than the average reader, so I had higher expectations. On the other hand, I had very little knowledge of advanced mathematics, so the camel's thoughts about math were entirely lost on me. Yeah, I just kind of assumed you bastard knows what he's talking about. Perhaps readers with a background in math would appreciate it or find humor in it. As I often joke, I went to school for words, not numbers, lol. Overall, I look at pyramids as establishing the background for the later novel, Small Gods. True. Spoilers, things I enjoyed, how the Masons use levitation to assemble the pyramids, how the necropolis literally became a city of the dead, how Tepic's ancestors helped him climb the pyramid by making a mummy pyramid for him to stand on their shoulders, and the embalmers working on the dead. We can always count on Pratchett to give us a window into the lives of the working classes and their dirty jobs. Thanks for hosting the read-along and allowing fans to contribute to the discussion. I appreciate your hard work. I appreciate your comments because again, you are the reason I came back. Uh, firstly, oof on that last line, given that I read it and responded to it a few weeks before I vanished. Uh, whoops. I really thought I was going to have this out on time, and a year went by. I shouldn't have taken that nap. Still, I'm very glad you're here, or hopefully still here. I'm glad that all of you are still here, or hopefully still here. Thank you very much for your appreciation for the work that goes into these, and for your patience as I work on it, uh, and get things slowly rolling again. To address the bulk of your comment though, I really appreciate you taking the time to share such insights with me. Character development here is definitely something that I find to be one of the strongest weaknesses of Pyramids. The characters really don't develop at all, and it also doesn't make as good use of the background that Tepic has in being an assassin as I would expect. Um, in fact, reading it, especially when he started doing acrobatic stuff to get to the Pyramid, I completely had forgotten that he had a background as an assassin. It just did, even though we just had the encounter with Chitter, like him being an assassin just did not come up nearly enough in the story for it to be super relevant to me. And I feel like if you remove the assassin part of this book, it wouldn't change a whole lot. There's a couple of times when he uses it, like when he's getting a disguise and he's sneaking Tracy out. And then when he's doing the acrobatic stuff and then when he encounters Chitter um, from the Assassin's Guild. But for the most part, it doesn't really play a significant role whatsoever in uh, the book. And if it had played a better one, I would have felt more grounded with Tepic. And that's just an example. Tracy is even more poorly developed. Doesn't make any sense. We just learn things about her as they become relevant, which is pretty rare for something about Tracy to become relevant. Character development in Pyramids, not great. Story development also not super fantastic, but the world building is pretty solid and it does set a good foundation, not just for Small Gods, but for several others. But yes, Small Gods especially, this is a foundational novel for that one. We had like great character developments in the novels leading up to this one and fantastic stories as well. And so Pyramids feels like a very drastic fall off in uh, 
honestly just enjoyment as far as character development and story is concerned. It's definitely lackluster in comparisons to those ones as well, let alone uh, lackluster as a standalone Discworld novel. I wouldn't recommend Pyramids to somebody as the novel to start reading Discworld. Now, I do want to touch especially on the bits with the gods, which I talked about earlier when I was summarizing the book. That did really suck to read. The gods were just kind of there and it didn't feel like Pratchett knew what to do with them except for the fact that I do think it was kind of funny. I I've got some amusement and some enjoyment out of the fact that the gods were just kind of in the background destroying stuff. And so occasionally while the prophets and priests and stuff were talking to each other, Terry Pratchett would throw in a line or two about just this massive wave of destruction in the background as the gods fought one another. But I would have liked definitely to see some sort of interaction with the gods besides them being this set piece. I think the gods could have done more than just be background, but again, I think it's kind of funny that they were just in the background destroying everything. Thank you very much, Amy, and uh, thank you for sticking around. We're gonna move on to the next comment from Evil DM MK3. I'm not a huge fan, my father is, but he also keeps pointing out jokes that are references to things I didn't know about. Like how Tepic dropping stuff is a reference to the 1950s kids wizard show, Cracker Jack, where you had to hold onto prices and got cabbages to hold for wrong answers or how the assassin's exam closely mirrors the old UK driving test, upside down road signs and all. I am left wondering how much of a headache the Gel Valley gives the order of when. Okay, so I did not catch either of those references either because I'm not from the UK, nor am I from the 1950s, as far as I know. So I did not catch either of those, but that is very amusing, uh, especially the old UK driving test one. That one, that is really funny. So that's hilarious, and I really love that bit of information, so thank you for sharing that. I also understand, like, yeah, a lot of the references definitely would be ones that would go over your head and go over my head as well. There's a lot of references in there, I'm sure, that I just didn't get, which Amy also commented on. Just there's some stuff in there you might not get as far as references are concerned. And that's kind of just something that you endure doing any kind of pop culture reference or any um, time period based reference. Some people eventually are just not going to get it and it's going to be lost on them and they'll move past it and not really think twice about it. I appreciate having those pointed out to me. That is pretty interesting to know and I will hold on to that information hopefully for the rest of my life. Uh, next, uh, Sassy Susie for you says, Pyramids has always been meh for me. Well written and gives some assassins insights. I just prefer the watch, which is, and of course, rinse wind. Yes, I definitely agree or I agree now. I initially, again, thought Pyramids was one of my favorites. On a reread, it is lackluster. It's just not as great uh, as I remember it being. The Gods series, not my favorite. I do remember loving small gods more than loving Pyramids, but again, I'm now really questioning my past taste in Discworld, and I don't know what my favorite is going to end up being now because I did love Pyramids so much, and now I'm wondering what other Discworld books were just enjoyed by me so much because of where I was at as a person when I read them. This one, not super great, but I am really excited about getting to the next ones. I can't wait to read Guards Guards next. Next we have uh, Kenneth Lawson who said, I didn't like the beginning of this book mainly because Tepic didn't have enough agency until he decided to save Tracy. Then when we started down the path of the book, we finally get to learn anything about him. And I did actually like him as a protagonist, though I did like what we got of the Assassin's Guild. I'm a little confused on whether or not you like him as an I think you I think what you're saying is you did like Tepic and then you also liked what we got of the Assassin's Guild. I see what you're saying now. Okay, I'm going to rephrase this a bit. Um Okay, Kenneth Lawson says, I didn't like the beginning of this book, except the Assassin's Guild, uh, mainly because Tepic didn't have enough agency until he decided to save Tracy. Then when we started down the path of the book, uh, we finally got to learn basically anything about him and uh, Kenneth did like him as a protagonist. And I agree. Um, again, the beginning of the book, definitely a super rocky start. I think I mentioned that when I was talking about book one in the summary section of the video. Not a great start to it, especially jumping between multiple different time periods without a lot of clarity on exactly what was happening. So yeah, I think it's just a really weak start to the book. Even if the Assassin's Guild is great and I loved being introduced to it, I don't think it was the best start to the book itself. However, I do have a slight counter argument to not feeling like Tepic had any agency. I remember who I was when I was just kind of going through the motions of tradition and I was a zombie and I was essentially just being swept along by the plot and not making any of my own decisions. And anything that I wanted to do in my life was guided by these beliefs and traditions that I had held for pretty much my entire life. It is wild to me what I wanted to do with my life 
back then, back when I held these beliefs and where I saw my life going, who I saw my uh, life being spent with. I was just going through all of the motions and doing the things that I expected myself to do because of my beliefs. When I read this book a year ago, I didn't think this, but rereading it for this video now, I do believe that Tepic being uh, essentially a zombie who is swept along by the plot and has no agency or personality, I think that is also a reflection of just being completely along for the ride of the traditionalism. Tepic kind of goes along with everything, even when he does try to make changes. When those changes aren't allowed, he doesn't really stand up for himself. He just goes, oh, that sucks. And then he finally does have enough. He finally has that moment that spurs him into having agency when he goes, okay, I'm not gonna let Tracy just die. This guy wants to sentence this woman to death. I'm not gonna allow that. And he finally gets up. And that's the catalyst, I think, for him finally rejecting the notion that tradition just has to be accepted for what it is. Him being a zombie and not really having much personality in the beginning, I think is intentional. But the real question is, is it well written? And is it clear that that's intentional? And I don't think that it is. I think it could be more accurately executed. So those are your thoughts. And those are my thoughts on pyramids. But just because I have already put this video out there does not mean the discussion is over. If you have additional thoughts on it, or if you did not get to share your thoughts before, but wanted to share your thoughts on pyramids now, if you have thoughts and responses to anything that I've said in this video, feel free to comment and keep the discussion going. I would love to continue talking about pyramids, especially because I have now remembered why pyramids meant so much to me earlier in my life, and it has now renewed that meaning for me today. If you want to continue the discussion of pyramids, feel free to comment or go back to the old discussion post in my community, whatever you want to do. I would love to keep talking about pyramids with you uh, and keep this discussion rolling. It's time for me to get to my closing remarks. And in order to do that, I think I want to go uh, to one more room uh, and just kind of change the scenery because it's getting really hot in here right now. And I don't want to keep holding this microphone. So I will, uh, I'll be back. That is much better. Okay. Um, what do you want? Hmm? I'm almost done. Pyramids is both worse and better than I remember it being. Um, when I first read it for this read-along, I kind of agree with everybody else and thought, yeah, three, maybe three and a half stars at the best. Um, I don't remember why I loved it so much. It's kind of mediocre compared to the rest of Discworld. That was where I was prepared to leave it. That is the essay that I had written this time last year is just saying that I think it's fine. And then a year passed and I had to reread it again to create a new essay. Um, and when I reread it again, I didn't think I was going to be writing a new essay. I just wanted to make sure that I understood the book so that I could go into it uh, with at least some recent knowledge of what happened in Pyramids. And then I discovered as I was reading back through my essay after having reread Pyramids uh, last month or two months, I think two or three months ago now, um, at the time of this filming, um, I realized, oh, I know why I love Pyramids so much. And this essay that I wrote does not reflect how I feel about the book anymore at all. And so meeting Pyramids where it was at and Pyramids meeting me where I was at contributed to me enjoying this book um, a whole lot more. Do not lick my pants. That is so weird. I mean, it sucks that I waited a year, but I also think it's good that I waited a year because it was able to give me more perspective on the book um, that I wasn't going to have at that time because of just where I was at um, then. Since then, a lot has happened, a lot has changed, and more about me has changed and I have changed and reflecting on who I was a year ago and accepting the different person that I am today and the different life that I have and the different goals um, that I have, it contributes to me thinking more of pyramids than I thought of it when I reread it last year. I think it's I think it is really interesting that this was the one that I wound up having a long gap for because pyramids is about change and it is about uh, altering your perception of things and yeah, that's what I went through this past year. For those of you who had commented beforehand, you commented a year ago expecting this discussion post to be live in May of 2023. Thank you very much for your comments and thank you again for sticking around and waiting and being patient with me. Um, everyone was really gracious about this. I never had anybody hounding me asking when it was gonna be over. I never felt like there was this expectation for me to come back before I was ready. Um, and it felt really good to be able to focus on other things while I was 
preparing to come back at some point. It was always on my mind, oh, I really want to get back and do that, but I'm just not in the headspace for it. I want to be genuine on here because to me, there's no point in being fake. I'm not doing this to make money. Obviously, I don't make money. I lose money. Um, when I'm doing this, like I, it doesn't make sense for me to be anybody but myself, and I didn't feel like I could be myself on camera for the past year um, as a result of everything that was going on. And so I focused on doing things by myself and on my own. I worked on a lot of things, and I talk about that as well in the video that I linked in the description if you want to go and check out the unlisted one uh, that just kind of talks about the hiatus that I took and what I have been working on and what's coming up here pretty soon. Again, just thank you for being there a year ago, and thank you for sticking around if you did. Thank you for being here today. I hope that you had a fantastic year and I look forward to what comes next, which brings us to what comes next. <sighs> okay. I would love to be able to tell you that I am ready to go back to doing once a month videos here. Um, the truth is I don't know that I am not because I don't want to. I would love, honestly, to go back to doing once a week videos like I used to do um, before I started the read along. I was doing, actually before I started the read along, I was doing three times a week and then I switched to one time a week and then I switched to once a month. Um, and I'd love to be able to tell you that I can at the very least go back to doing once a month. I'm not sure I can do once a month for the read along though. Um, I might release other videos on this. I have some ideas for things I'd like to talk about as far as storytelling and Discworld and all of that is concerned. Um, I, I have some things that I'd like to do, but I don't think that I'm in a place where I can commit to doing this monthly right now. Um, I will say it's not going to be another year before I do another one. Um, I am in a much better place as far as just personally and mentally. I can commit to being more consistent than yearly. I think that quarterly is a pretty good expectation for this read along right now. You know, once every three months. When I am ready to do this monthly, honestly, I will know that for sure at the end of this year. I'll know when I'm going to be ready and what kind of schedule I'm going to have. The rest of this year is just incredibly busy for me. So maybe next year I'll be able to go back to doing this monthly. But I think quarterly is good for just easing back into it and easing everybody else back into this as well, right? Everybody, unfortunately, had a forced hiatus from this particular read along. That means that the next book is Guards Guards and it should be read by September. I will put the uh, post up on my community and sometime around September, I don't have an exact date, but in the month of September, you should have the book read so that you are ready to participate in that. And then uh, a few weeks, probably after that post goes up, I will have the essay written, I will have it recorded, and I will go ahead and work on getting it edited. So you can expect September to be when the community post goes up. And um, sometime after that, hopefully shortly after that, I'll have the next video up. I'm being a lot more loose with it because I don't know what that is going to look like for me. Um, I know the rest of this year is going to be very busy for me, but this is something that I'm passionate about and I missed doing and that I enjoy doing. And even being on camera now, I'm really excited to get back to editing this video and uh, moving along with that. So again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for participating in the read along. I look forward to reading Guards Guards. Again, I love Guards Guards and I think that just about everybody is excited to get into it. Um, most people really enjoy this one. It's our first book that really follows the watch. And uh, yeah, I, I can't wait to dive into it with you and to see what everybody thinks of it. I hope, and I'm pretty confident that Guards Guards is going to be as fantastic as I remember it being uh, the last several times that I read it, but we will see. I'm a different person now, so who knows? How did I used to end these videos? Um, Thank you so much for checking this out. If you want to see another video from me, you can do so by clicking up here, right? Clicking up here. Uh, and with that, or until next time, well, I don't know, bye. Thank you for that. And I look forward to me cutting down that little rant I just did because it does not need to be five or seven minutes long. Uh, anyway.